So first, this is a diagram of the hippocampal system and how it is interconnected with other areas. We looked at this a little bit in chapter five. Uh, and the key point is that the hippocampus sits on top of the cortex. Um, so we have the parietal cortex dorsal stream uh, about all the uh, spatial information, uh, where you are in, in space comes in through this pathway. And then you have the ventral stream, uh, all the information in object recognition, all those kind of semantic knowledge those go into two higher level areas known as the parahippocampal cortex and the perirhinal cortex. And then those then feed into the entorhinal cortex, rhinal here again being the, the um, olfactory kind of nose uh, Latin root um, having to do with the fact that the actual olfactory cortex is nearby in the same area, but these are not intrinsically olfactory areas. They're really high level consolidation areas, integrating knowledge from all over your brain, funneling it down into this really narrow, very condensed, very high level summary of everything that's going on in your brain. That then gets encoded by what we call the hippocampus proper, um, otherwise known as the hippocampal formation, which consists of the dentate gyrus, this area CA3, which is otherwise known as corno ammonis or Ammon's horn, uh, again, based on the anatomical appearance of this. Uh, and then you have CA1, there's also a CA2 that actually is important. It's a little bit smaller than these other areas, not as frequently talked about. You also have the sabiculum, which is interconnected with the, uh, and functions much like the CA1. Uh, but goes down to subcortical areas in the amygdala and it's very important for kind of emotional aspects of memory. These arrows show you the key principle that, you know, feed forward information coming up goes up into these areas and is encoded principally here in the connections between CA3 and itself, these kind of recurrent connections. And also the most important synapses really are between CA3 and CA1. Um, and here, this is taking a pattern separated, very uh, distinctive encoding of the in overall pattern of activity in entorhinal cortex, um, and, and then associating that with a corresponding representation of activity in CA1. And the key thing about the CA1 representation is that it's able to unpack this uh, activity pattern later when we retrieve the memory into all the full, full blown kind of detailed uh, activity patterns out in the rest of the cortex. So it's really the memory de-indexer. And these things are really forming here in the dentate gyrus and the CA3, a kind of index, a pointer that says this memory is really the combination of all these different elements all those elements are, are really represented out in the cortex. And I'm just going to retain just these kind of pointers to those index elements um, and kind of actually form essentially a hash code of that set of uh, elements. Um, and if you know about uh, hash codes in computer science, it's really a very similar kind of concept that there's a very nonlinear mapping between the individual elements and the overall pattern of activity here um, so that you end up with a great uh, probability of getting a unique pattern of activity up here for any given uh, complex pattern of activity coming in through the, the antirhinal cortex. And that hash code is then what the memory system encodes. And that's why the hippocampus can be as small as it is and still do the incredible job it does remembering so much information because it does it very efficiently using these kind of hash codes. And then the job of the CA1 in this context is essentially to unpack, dereference, to take that hash code and, and, and kind of blow it back up into the full set of information that actually constitutes the full memory. Such that you can get a, a retrieval cue, what happened yesterday, and you can think about it, and then you get back from your hippocampal system kind of complete memories. And the lessons we just learned about the importance of very few neurons being active and other forces in the network that cause those neurons to be unlikely to be duplicated across different memories to be separated.
across memories. That's really what's happening in the dentate gyrus in the CA3. And we can see this by looking at uh, recordings of neural activity. These are done in rats. In this case, the rats are running in and out of this kind of eight arm radial maze, one of the classic uh, paradigms that are used to, to look at hippocampal uh, activity in rats. And what you see is that in CA3, uh, individual neurons will fire very, very selectively for just, in this case, firing uh, as the rat is running back in on this particular arm, a little bit on this other arm, but mostly just this one arm. And so this highly selective uh, pattern of firing is also known as sparse activity. It just means that um, on average, the neurons don't fire very often. and That's what allows you to avoid interference. So you're essentially making sure that these individual neurons that are encoding information and knowledge about what happens in this arm, that won't bleed over to get interfered by information or, or events that happen in these other arms. And that's um, to a, a lesser extent true of CA1. Uh, it has a slightly higher level of activity and therefore less pattern separation. And then entorhinal cortex, which is representative of cortex itself, has a much higher level of activity and therefore very little kind of uh, separation. And in individual neuron, these are again plots of the firing activity of an individual neuron um, is active in essentially every single arm. And similarly with the subiculum. And so this is a very, very distinctive pattern that says individual neurons are just taking this tiny little piece of the, the overall puzzle and really trying to remember that specific detail so that they don't get the interference. And people have talked about these as place fields, but really in any given environment, the particular place where a given neuron fires is entirely, almost entirely random. Um, and there's really no systematicity. These things can change with different uh, kind of events going on in the animal's life. Um, and so it's really, these are memories. These are not maps. That's a big debate still in the field, but I just have to say that. So here's a diagram uh, that we should be familiar. We look at this in the context of the cerebellum. Really the same principle, again, this principle that David Marr articulated originally, um, uh, that individual uh, patterns of activity that have fewer neurons active can uh, have, a, have a general mathematical tendency to have less overlap, therefore have pattern separation, um, just based on the pure mathematical probabilities. If you have fewer neurons, there's less chance of them firing together.